Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa la aqibat lil muttaqeen Wa la udwana illa ala al-dhalimeen Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah Wa ahtahu la sharika la Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh Sallallahu alayhi Wa ala alihi wa ashabi Wa man da'a bi da'watihi Wa stanna bi sunnati Ila yawm al-deen Wa sallam tasliman kathira Amma ba'd all praises are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. And surely there is no animosity except for the oppressor. And I bear witness that Allah is one and has no partners. And that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, is his servant and his last messenger. And may Allah always and constantly send peace and blessings to Muhammad, to his family, to his companions, to all those who call to his way and establish his sunnah to the day of judgment. As to what follows, my beloved brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, it is a great pleasure uh, to be here uh, and to um, again be in a masjid uh, in the uh, Ottoman style, the Turkish style. Alhamdulillah, it takes me back uh, to a journey uh, that I had to Istanbul uh, where we had a number of people who came from Cape Town and we went into the Middle East. And in the journeys of my life, I remember there was three times when I stood in uh, a state of awe, when I was um, dumbstruck by, by the size and the majesty of the building and the place where I was at. The first and the greatest uh, experience that I've ever had like many of you, is coming into um, Mecca al Mukarramah and then looking at the Kaaba for the first time. And when you look at it, it strikes you. It takes you back centuries to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And you feel something of this, uh, the spiritual presence. You know, and the people making tawaf. There is nothing like uh, looking at people who are making tawaf. And so that memory stayed with me uh, and will always stay with me. Also going to the Prophet's uh, masjid, masjid and nabi والسلام, and feeling the sakina, the peace as you enter into Medina. And um, I had the opportunity to go there to Medina uh, around 1973. And um, this is when Medina was totally different than what it is now. And you get more of the original uh, feeling of uh, Medina and uh, the, the, the next time when I was struck by you know a, a presence a physical presence of a location was in Cairo in Egypt when I went to the pyramids and when you stand near the pyramid of Giza and you see the size of this building and you reflect upon the size of the structure and the uh, knowledge that the people must have had to build this structure. It's something that you know you, you can't put it together. And studying the history of, e history of Egypt, I recognize the fact that this pyramid was not built by um, the, the Pharaoh that we know uh, in the Quran itself. It was built long time before the Fir'aun. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا عَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِي بِالْتَاغُوتِ That we have sent to every nation a messenger. That they would worship Allah and stay away from false deities. And so the ancient Egyptians had something. They had something that the world still does not fully understand. And I stood at awe at the size of this building and to think that people at that point in time could have constructed something like this uh, is, uh, is mind-boggling. The other time when I stood at awe at a structure is when I went to Istanbul and then looking at the Blue Mosque, looking at the structures that the Uthmaniyya, that the Ottomans had built uh, it struck me um, at the size of the structures and how much power Muslims actually had. 
And if you go back in history and look at the buildings in other parts of the world at that point in time, you realize how much power and authority actually was in the hands of Muslims and how much of a loss it was to us when the Khilafat was taken down uh, in that part of the world, a major loss to the Ummah that we will not regain until we have the, the consciousness to rebuild the Khilafah and to have our, our, our Amir al-Mu'mineen uh, who at least can have some central authority for the Muslim world. And so Alhamdulillah, uh, again seeing this structure and being with this community, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would bless the people who are living in Turkey and would renew the strength and all those who are struggling in that part of the world. May Allah give them strength at this point in time in the struggle that they are going through with the secular forces trying to, to stop Islam. May Allah raise back Islam in that part of the world uh, and give strength uh, to the people as they had in the past. Brothers and sisters, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to us in his glorious book, in the Arabic language, a revelation that was not only of vital importance to the believers in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu but it is still of great importance to us today. And when we read the Quran, we should not read it just as you read any book. We should not read it even as some people want to just memorize. But in the words of uh, one of the great scholars of Africa, of North Africa, Sidi Ahmed Zarouk, Rahimahullah, and he in uh, one of his texts, An Nasihatul Kafia, Liman Khasahullahu Bil Afia. In this text, he was speaking about sincerity to the Quran. How are you sincere to the Book of Allah? And he said this three things. Tahseen tilawatihi, wa tadabbu ayatihi, wa itba awamirihi. Three things. First, tahseen tilawatihi, that we should beautify its recitation. And secondly, we should reflect on its verses. So it's not enough just to read the Quran with tajweed. And the Prophet ﷺ said the time would come when people would read this Quran with beautiful tones and it would not pass their throats. It would just be a beautiful sound. So tahseen tilawatihi wa tadabbur ayatihi wa itba awamirihi that we should follow its commands. So it is not enough just to read it and think about it. But those thoughts need to be interpreted into actions. We have to follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us and look at this Quran as a guide and that which will give us knowledge not only of this time but of the future to come. And in this light, Allah Azza wa Jal has reve revealed in the oft-repeated verses, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitani Rajeem, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amunu attaqu allaha haqqa tuqati wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. O you who believe, fear Allah, in the way he should be feared and do not die except in a state of Islam. And so here Allah tells us that we should have the consciousness in this world, al khawf wa raja we should fear Allah, hope in the mercy of Allah, surround ourselves with a wiqaya, a shield of taqwa, and we should not, we should or try our best to leave this world in a state of Islam. And so the word is used, la tamutunna, and this is a confirmation, illa wa antum muslimun. Do not die except in a state of Islam. Islam, that you have submitted to Allah. And so we're leaving the world and we should be in a state of Islam, salama. The Quran speaking again about the hereafter takes us now from the stage of death 
to the hereafter. And then Allah has revealed in Surah to Shu'ara verse 89, Yoma la wa la banun illa man atallahu biqalbin salim. That on that day, on the day of judgment, your wealth nor your children will be of no benefit to you. The only benefit a person will get is the one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. Biqalbin Salim. And Salim is also from Salama. And so that state of Islam, the heart needs to be in the state of Islam. That we not only say that we're Muslims, but that we are in submission to Allah, enter into the Barzakh zone of the next life as Muslims, and when we come to Allah Azza wa Jal, the only benefit we will get is to have a sound heart, that we are in this uh, tranquil state, in submission and in peace. And so the heart is a crucial object. The heart is the essence. It is not just that lump of flesh. The heart, as you can see, coming to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not just the, the, the lump of flesh pumping blood. But it is your conscience. It is that which connects to your soul, which is telling you to do what is right, which can be affected either way. It's something inside of us which, which energizes us and, and, and helps us to make decisions and gives us emotions in many of our affairs. And this heart, one of the key elements in the heart is haya. It is modesty. It is decency. The Prophet ﷺ said, even spoke about that haya, in al haya min al iman, wal iman fil jannah. That verily, decency and modesty is part of faith, and iman will lead you to paradise. So haya is a crucial uh, concept. It's a crucial ability or a, cru a crucial quality that we should have within ourselves. And haya is not just modesty or shyness it is something to do with limits that we know the limits of each other and the real shame and modesty is not just from human beings it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so we are modest because of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not because we fear people and the Prophet sallallahu said there were three people in Quraysh three people they were the best of people. When they spoke to you, they would tell you the truth. And when you spoke to them, they would not accuse you of lying. They would not suspect you. They believe what you say. In other words, they're innocent. You're innocent until proven guilty. They accept what you say. There's three people. Abu Bakr as Siddiq, Uthman ibn Affan and Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu. Three people. And of these three, Abu Ubaidah stands uh, on the highest stage. And he is described as having, he was kathir al-haya. He was modest and shamed to the point where he, he wouldn't even look you in the face. But this modesty that he had is not weakness. He was just a shy person with believers. He is innocent person with you. But it is reported that when the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came, Abu Ubaidah, they describe him as the sharp part of the sword. He turned into a lion, Asad. He was humble and, and modest with believers. But when the enemies of Allah came, when danger came, he became a lion. He was the first in the line. No fear in his heart. And so this is the description of a believer. This is the modesty we're talking about. This is the haya. It is a modesty with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
It is a modesty that uh, is so important to us, especially today, in the time period when the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have now developed the ability to enter into our homes with the television and with cell phones, internet, and they can teach our children. You might be at work, you're outside, and, and this thing, this machine, is teaching your children how to lie. Or teaching your children filthy habits. How to swear. Racism. To make them ashamed of being Muslim. And one of the most dangerous parts is it, it is taking away sensitivities. Taking away sensitivities. That if you are watching a program, if the child is watching a program, and then sees, that person sees on the program, he sees a man or a group of men raping a woman. This is a horrific act that most human beings will never see. If you live your life naturally in the world, you will never see anything like this. There are some times when they even have, he rapes the woman and he kills her. And the child is watching that. How many people will see this in their life? How many times will you see murder going on? Mass murder, people being tortured. And those who come from the front lines, those who are involved in warfare, go through a state of shock, a trauma that they go through. Because human beings are not used to seeing this. We're not used to seeing things like this. We're not made to see this. And it is said that when uh, the American forces were landing on the shores, they always talk about World War II, and they're coming on the shores in Iwo Jimo, and these countries, they're raising the flag, and they're coming on the shores. The psychologists revealed that when they hit the shores, about 60% of the soldiers froze. They couldn't move. 60% of them. They were in total fear because they knew that they would probably die. And the only time they started moving is when somebody shot them or, or someone else got shot and they had to run now and they have to react because somebody's trying to kill them and a human being has a natural ability to survive. So in order to survive, you will run and you will struggle because you have to survive. But it is not within a human being to kill or to just throw yourself to suicide. That is not in a normal human being state of mind. Similarly, it is not within a human being state of mind to be involved in adultery and fornication and especially to see things like rape and murder. What it does, it takes away your haya. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَهِ فَاسْنَعْ مَا شِئْتَ if you don't have haya, then do what you want to do. If you don't have hudud, you don't have limits, you are capable of doing anything. You can do anything. And so this haya is a crucial thing. And the punishments, the things that are happening on this earth today, they talk about the environmental struggle. They talk about and they say it's overpopulation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to us over 1400 years ago, we already knew what was going to happen to the environment when in Surah Al Rum, verse uh, 41, Allah reveals, A'udhu billahi min shaytani rajim, dahar al fasadu fil barri wal baha, bima kasabat aydin nas, liyudhikahum ba'dal ladhi amilu la'allahum yarji'un. Corruption has appeared on the land and the sea because of what people's hands have done. And we will make them taste something of what they have earned in order that they would return to the path. And so facade, it is here. It's environmental for corruption. Pollution, deforestation. In some countries, in Canada, we even have what is called acid rain. And that is where the rain, because it's so polluted, the clouds, 
When the rain comes down, it's filled with poison. And so it actually poisons you instead of giving you benefit. And so the actions of people are what is bringing on what we see in the environment. And the Prophet ﷺ said in authentic hadith, إِذَا ظَهَرَ الزِّنَا وَالْرِبَا فِي قَرْيَا فَقَدْ أَحَلُّوا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ عَذَابُ اللَّهِ That if adultery and fornication and interest and usury come amongst the people, then they have brought the punishment of Allah onto themselves. They have brought it onto themselves. And Sadaqa Allah al Azim, Sadaqa Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam, it has come to pass, and our younger generation is in a serious situation. Because things that we never even considered, when many people in previous generations are growing up, they're not even involved in sexuality until they're in their late teens, 20s, or maybe in their 30 years old. But now the younger generation is, 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 is seeing this, and adultery is so widespread. It is a horrible thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Allah tells us, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَ وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا Allah said, don't come near to zina. He didn't say, don't do it. Like you'll see other things, other sins, وَلَا تَقْتُلُ nafs. أَلَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ Do not kill. Right? Do not take uh, intoxicants. But here it says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ zina. Don't come near to it. Why would that be? Because killing, as we said, is not a natural thing to see somebody die. It is not a natural thing for a robbery to take place and somebody screaming and they lost their goods. But a relationship between male and female, Allah made us for that. Allah made an attraction between male and female and so when you carry out the act, you are doing something natural. Your body thinks it's natural. That's why Allah said, don't come near it. Don't come near it. And so the struggle that is going on, the struggle for Haya, this is a crucial struggle which is affecting Muslims today. And the, 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 the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the secular forces, they know this very well. And so they are pressurizing Muslims, pressurizing us to wear the tightest of clothes. And this is not only female, that's male as well. Pressurizing us for the man to look like a woman, for the woman to look like a man. Pressurizing us, especially for the woman in hijab, to force her to take it off. They can't stand it. They hate to see it. Because it represents haya, and the shaitan and his forces know that this is one of the elements that makes the heart of a believer sound. It, it makes you, it keeps you on the path. It is reported that two years ago, a woman in Germany, a Muslim woman, wearing hijab, that she was taking her child out and she went to a park and she wanted to have the child ride the swing. But on the swing was a skinhead, a right wing skinhead, he was riding the swing. And he looked at her and she said, can you get off the swing, my baby can ride? And then he started to swear at her and to curse her and to call her a fundamentalist Muslim Islamist, terrorist, wearing your, your hijab, insulting her, and continuing on as much as he could. She was a strong sister though, and she took it to the authorities. And in Germany and most Western countries, they have laws against abuse. They have laws for this. And so she took it to the court, and the man was fined 780 euros. 
he had to pay a fine. But the skinhead was mad because there's more to this thing than just paying the fine. To him, it was a struggle. He had, he had fought against a Muslim, a woman who's wearing hijab, who they think is attacking their society. He insulted her, he attacked her, he thought he did his job, so he appealed the case. The case came up last summer in July, and the sister Marwa Sherbini, who was an Egyptian woman, she and her husband were in uh, the courtroom, and when she went to make her testimony, and she had her child with her, and she was pregnant, just imagine this now, you are in the courtroom, a civil courtroom, the judge is there, and all the people have suits on, and the press is there, and the police are standing there, and the skinhead jumped off his booth, and he grabbed the sister, and he stabbed her 18 times. 18 times, man. Not once, 18 times. He stabbed her in front of everybody, and then her husband got up and ran to try to save her, and the police shot her husband. Not the skinhead. They shot the husband. And then the world, then it broke. And the world recognized this. But they didn't move. The secular countries who, saw, who see the hijab, who see modesty as one of their enemies, they didn't move. They didn't take it serious. Muslim countries tried to move. But they didn't take it serious. And finally, he has been uh, found guilty. But where is the reaction? Where, where was the press? Where, where is the people coming out and, and, and feeling disgusted? A woman pregnant with her child right there, stabbed 18 times in a court. This is the battle for Haya is the battle for modesty. And this battle is deeper than what you think. It is deeper than what you think. The Christian missionaries call the battle, the battle for the hearts. They are struggling now in our countries. They are struggling using the mass media, using internet movies, battling for the hearts of people. And behind them is the shaitan, the evil one, who wants to take us off the path. And so this struggle that we see is a serious one. The battle for the hearts. The heart is that which, as the Prophet ﷺ said, there is a lump of flesh in the body. He said there is a lump of flesh in the body if it is sound, the whole body is sound. And if it is corrupted, the whole body is corrupted. And that is the heart. And so the struggle going on now in our countries, it's not only a hot war. There is a hot war going on in many parts. Muslims are under the gun. But there is another struggle which is deeper, which is for the very essence, our essence, our hearts. It's for the hearts of our children and for the future generations. And that is the real struggle that is going on. And our people are facing this all over the world. And so we have to realize how important it is to protect the heart. We need to protect ourselves. And the great ulama have told us very clearly, man arafa qalbahu arafa rabba. Whoever knows his heart, knows his Lord. So we need to know ourselves. We need to know what's inside of us. And then we really have our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The scholars have also shown us that the heart is like, is like a fortress around it. And there are certain gates that lead inside of it. And there are soldiers protecting these gates. And so we need to know 
what are the gates the shaitan and his forces are trying to get inside trying to get inside the heart and to reach us to take us off the path and this struggle is not as clear as what you think it is sometime it is very it is something which you think is a trivial thing but it's not a small thing it opens up a way for your heart to be destroyed and so we need to, to know Madakhil Iblis we need to know the inroads of the shaitan to our hearts and the great scholars have shown us Ibn Qudama al-Maqtasi Rahimahullah and other scholars have shown us that from these madakhil entrances into the heart one of the gates that the shaitan used to get to us is hasad it is envy and jealousy and hasad is that quality when you see your brother or your sister who make some progress and you become jealous of that person they have a new baby he has a new car and you see him inside of this and you're jealous of it if you want one like his or like her that's okay but hasad is when you want the baby and you don't like their baby and some people will say evil things they will say evil things about the brother they see Zaid comes riding up in his new Lamborghini now how do you feel about your brother Zaid you used to like him right but now you see Zaid in a Lamborghini so now what do you say about him some will say well you know stock for Allah look at him he probably got this uh, uh, on the lottery it's an ugly car anyway look at the color of it so they will just say wicked things right that's the shaitan that's hasad and this thing is a dangerous thing and the worst thing about it is that the hasid is more affected than the mahsud the one who has the hasad he is more in trouble than the other one the prophet sallallahu said iyakum wal hasad fa inna al hasada yakul hasanati kama taqulu nal al hata beware of jealousy it will eat up your good deeds like a fire eats up firewood you go to hajj you fast in Ramadan and you're jealous of another person it burns up all your deeds someone makes a little progress they have a nice masjid and so what do you say I'm not gonna go to that masjid that's a Turkish masjid I'm not gonna go there that's the shaitan talking to you this is the house of Allah regardless of who set it up and so jealousy is one of the ways that the evil one can come to our hearts and destroy us in this world another point which was brought up in this study is anger it is anger and this is considered to be rule al-aqal it is the monster of intelligence because when you become angry your intelligence is gone out your ear you're no longer you don't think with your mind anymore emotion starts coming over the person they foam at the mouth they tear they rip they, they go out of control and so anger is a dangerous way and we need to control our anger our emotions need to be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we need to love for Allah and if we hate and have anger it, sh it should be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not for ourselves and it needs to be controlled discipline and self-control and so this emotion this actually is a door by which the evil one can come into our hearts another area is the shahwa and this is desires that through our desires the evil one comes to us enters into our minds into our bodies especially those desires and one of the areas that the ulama show us is when we are filled that is the shaba when we are, are, are filled with food when we feel uh, satisfied with the dunya satisfied with the world and we lay back this is a way that the evil one billah, comes to us <clears throat> and when we look at Islamic societies and we were studying uh, Andalusia the other day 
And you will see the early generations who entered into uh, Spain and Portugal, into Andalusia, Tariq ibn Ziyad, Rahimahullah, Musa bin Nusayr. And when they entered in and they were striving and struggling and calling to the good, <coughs> forbidding evil, Allah gave them power. But the next generation got a little bit weaker. And by the third and fourth generation, when they were satisfied and their wealth had poured in, <coughs> they started getting corrupt. And so when that happened, then they lost their authority and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put upon them uh, forces that had no mercy upon them. And it was not until the Murabitun came out of North Africa and revived Islam in Al-Andalus that it came back to its heights. And so being satisfied, filling ourselves up, this is a dangerous quality and an a door by which the evil one well, Iyadu Billah can come into us. Another interesting point that the scholars make is that one of the entrances of the evil one into the hearts is the love of fancy clothes. To have fancy clothes, a fancy house, right? When you love these things and you build these things inside of this world, and, you, and you're into, you love it so much, then you start to forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that does not mean that we have to walk around with rags on. But we have to be moderate. We have moderation in how we dress and how we act. When we cover ourselves with gold and silver and with jewels and show off with our clothing, then we have entered a dangerous area where the evil one can come to us. Remember how important it is Remember, never forget that Allah says when He speaks about the Day of Judgment, that on the Day of Judgment, your wealth, your money will be of no benefit unless your heart is sound. So you have to protect your heart. Another one of the entrances into the heart is when you uh, desire people, when you glorify people and you make them like idols in front of your eyes and then you desire to be like them. And you glorify and glorify and glorify individuals. And this is one of the ways that the shaitan wa iyadu billah comes into our hearts. And it's so strange when you come into different countries and our countries have fallen into this too. When you come into the countries and you see in every door or every uh, shop a picture of the president. Everybody has a picture. And they glorify the individual. In some countries, the people hardly ever see the head of state. He is so protected and, and supposed to be so high. In ancient times, the head of state, you could not even see him doing anything but sitting there. You can't see him like a human being who gets weak and has a stomach ache and has problems because they want you to glorify that person in the place of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you look at the leaders, when they came into uh, Medina and they look for Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anh, who was the most powerful man in the world at that time and they said, where is Umar? And they said, look over there under that tree and he's sleeping there with his turban on a rock. He's sleeping. No bodyguards. Okay, and they go over and they, they, they call, that's Umar, that's Amir al-Mu'mineen. Because he, he was not afraid of anybody. He was not afraid of his people. Today if our leader comes, three days the soldiers are standing on the street. And they kick you out the way because the leader, he's just going to pass by in the car. And sometimes he's not even in the car. totally different because that glorification leads to the position of the Fir'aun, of the Taghut, of those who are worshipped in the place of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another important issue that comes up in this struggle for the heart is Al-Ajala. It is haste. And the Prophet peace be upon him said, Al-Ajala min as shaitan That haste is from the devil. That's clear. We do things uh, in a rush. 
and we find Ajala in our relationship, one of the most dangerous things that can happen is when a man, especially he's angry at his wife and he said talak, 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 talak. And talak comes out of his mouth like water. And after he says this, then he regrets it. He's sorry then. And he shops around for a fatwa. He wants a mufti who will tell him he can go back into his marriage. But he divorced his wife over and over and over and over again. Because he's hasty. He does things too hasty. And when we're getting into the marriages, we need to take time and to look at kafa'a, look at the wealth of the person, at their genealogy, their beauty, and especially their deen. And you judge these aspects. And the Prophet ﷺ said, if you choose the deen, you will be successful. Put that over all things. Take your time and make a right choice. And so decisions, making decisions, that's where shura comes in. وَأَمْرُهُمْ shura بَيْنَهُمْ That we should have mutual consultation in everything that we do. Not only in our personal life, but in our family life, in our, in our masjids, our community. We need to sit together and to make decisions together. The leadership needs to listen to the people in the jama'ah. Ah. So haste is a dangerous thing, but uh, the scholars say that you are, you are allowed haste in certain areas, only in certain areas. One of those ways which you are allowed to do things fast is when salat comes in. You can make your salat, do it as soon as you possibly can. Also, if you have a zad wa rahila, if you have enough money on you and the ability to go to Mecca, then you should make Hajj. Don't wait and say, uh, 20 years when I reach 50 years old, or I reach 60 years old, then I'll make Hajj. Don't wait until that time. Don't take your money and go to uh, Paris, or you go to London, or you go to uh, uh, Disneyland, or you go to New York City. Make your Hajj. If you have a Zadwa Rahila, if you have the ability to make that Hajj, then the scholars say, do it right away. Do it. And don't wait. Especially if you're young and strong, and you can go there and, and, and perform your monastic properly, then you should try to make that pilgrimage as soon as you possibly can. So these few points are the only ways where haste comes in. Another issue which is extremely important and one of the entrances into the heart that destroys us, and, and this is an interesting point that the scholars brought up, and it's amazing, some of these scholars live a thousand years ago, but it's like they're talking to us today. He said one of the entrances of the evil one into the hearts is when people become fanatical in their school of thought. Look at this, look at this wisdom. You become fanatical in your school of thought. I am a Hanafi. I am Maliki. I am Shafi'i. I'm not even talking about people who are outside of the deen. I'm talking about right in Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah, that people will become fanatic with each other. A brother came up to me one time and he said, Brother Abdullah, is it permissible for a Hanafi to marry a Shafi? So I said, what are you, Jehovah's Witness and Catholics? And what are you, man? Is it permissible? The Imams were students and teachers of each other. They had the highest respect for each other. And it is reported that when Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah, when he went to Iraq and he prayed Fajr in the masjid of Imam Abu Hanifa. And the Shafi'i's fatwa was at Fajr that you should make dua kunut. That you should make this dua. And the Shafi'i's will make dua kunut constantly in Fajr. And so they asked the Imam to lead Salat. And when he led the Salat, he did not make dua kunut. And they said, Subhanallah Imam, why didn't you make it? He said, I am in the masjid of Abu Imam Abu Hanifa. I respect his position. He respected his position. And so they were teachers and students of each other. It is reported that Imam Malik, Rahimahullah, the Imam of Dar al Hijrah, that he was in Medina and the governor of Mecca sent a young person to him and said, Teach this young man. 
And Imam Malik was the kind of person, he said, okay, I don't follow the governors. What, what is this? They said, look at the boy. So they brought the, the young man. And Imam Malik looked at him and asked him some questions. And then the people were surprised. Imam Malik said, this boy has a future. This boy has a future. Put him in a circle. Okay? You know who that boy was? That was Imam Shafi. That was Imam Shafi. He said, this boy has a future. So these are teachers and students of each other. They did not give us fiqh to divide us into different uh, religions or different groups as though we are Protestants and Catholics. And so the great scholars, Ibn Qudama, and other great scholars, they said one of the ways the shaitan can come to us is fanaticism in the school of thought. I will take it a step further even in Islamic movement because some people will not deal with another Muslim because he is not in his movement. He's not part of his jamaat, so I don't want to deal with him. But where did you get this from? As we discussed the other night, when you look at the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, you will see people doing different things. You will see some people who are involved in reading the Quran. You will see other people who are involved in giving dawah. Musa, uh, Musa ibn Umair, Mu'ad ibn Jabal. You will see them, they're du'at. You will see other people who are involved in jihad and struggle. You will see people doing all types of things, but at the end of the day, they are shoulder to shoulder. They do not have a special jamaat for dawah, and a special jamaat for aqidah, and a special jamaat for jihad, and a special uh, jamaat for Islamic education. No, these are all aspects of a community. Yes, we need a Khalifa. Some people cry, well, brother, we can't have nothing until we have a Khalifa. Who in his right mind would not think that we need a Khalifa? But how do we get a Khalifa? Do we deserve a Khalifa right now? If a Khalifa came today, if a person said, I am the Khalifa, I feel sorry for him. Man. They will say, you speak Arabic? Or someone says, do you speak Urdu? Let us say, are you Turkish? Do you speak Swahili? We would kill him before anybody else. So we don't, we, until we deserve a leader. The leader does not come out of space like an alien coming down and flying down on earth and suddenly he's your leader. The leader comes out of you. The leader comes out of the, the, the teachers and madrasa that we have. You look at the great uh, uh, leaders, it is said that uh, the, the, the Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih, it is said his teacher said to him, you will open Constantinople. He was taught this lesson from when he was young. This is your mission. You will open up Constantinople. It is also said S Sultan Salahuddin, Rahimahullah, he was a student underneath uh, uh, Nuruddin Zengi. He got his lessons from Nuruddin Zengi and his teachers gave him the guidance and then he grew up inside of this light and became the great Sultan Salahuddin Rahimahullah. So leaders do not come in a vacuum. They come out of our madrasa, they come out of our society and now is the time for unity amongst the Muslims. We need to look at each other and stop looking at another person and base his color or look at him and judge him because of his language or because of his tribe we need to look at each other and judge another person it's taqwa the Prophet ﷺ said is the consciousness of Allah which separates us it is not any of these physical things these physical things are here now and it goes away when I die when you die we go down under the ground and, and the body is no longer there. The only thing left in me is my soul. So the real me is a ruh. It is my soul. The real you is your soul. So we are a group of souls, arwah, who are here today 
with each other. And when we go into the Barzakh, there is no uh, Arabic soul, there's no Ajami soul, there's no European soul, no African soul, there's no female soul or male soul. We are Arawah. <coughs> Allah put us in this form that we would know one another, not despise one another. It's a test. Whatever form He puts you in, that's your test. And you have to live with this. And so, it is the time of unity and not fanaticism one way or another. If the Imam saw somebody else amongst the ulama who had something different than them or that they disagreed with, they would give advice to their brother. They would give advice. If the person disagreed, make dua. Make dua for that person. Don't scandalize that person, backbite, hate that person. Make dua for that person. Praise that Allah will, will help him if you think that you're right. <clears throat> that is the time that we are living in now. Another interesting point that comes in Madakhil Iblis, in the way that the shaitan comes to the hearts of individuals, and this is an interesting point that the scholars have brought up. They said when you force people to look for the, the sifat, the descriptions of Allah. If you spend your time looking for the descriptions of Allah and trying to figure out who is Allah, where is Allah, and then you're testing other people like this. You will go to a person and you say, where is Allah? Give me this uh, the descriptions of Allah. If that person answers right, you say, he's not a Muslim. Instead of teaching that person something that you know, you will test that person in order to bring that person down. This is one of the ways that the evil one, well, Iyadu Billah, comes to the hearts of the believers. And when we try to figure out the Qada, Qada and Qada, and we spend our time trying to figure it out, it weakens us. Because we will never figure out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, laysa kamithli hi shay. There is nothing similar to Allah. So why do we waste our time arguing over philosophy when there's children outside taking drugs? Our children are taking drugs. And there's drug dealers coming into our communities. And they're selling drugs to our children. And they will turn our girls and boys into prostitutes. I'm sorry for being so straightforward. But it's happening right now. And it's in our community. And they will increase the drugs in our community. They will increase the pornography in our community. Why? Because they want to take haya out of our hearts. And they want to make us do those things that they know will take us off the path. The final point of the many points uh, in dealing madakhil iblis that we need to watch out for, and that is suwa dhan al muslimin. And that is when you have suspicion you suspect other Muslims. You suspect people. You think bad thoughts about individuals before you even go to them. Suwadhan. And that is an important thing. That will destroy the heart of the individual. And so we need to uh, protect ourselves from the inside. Protect ourselves. Because Allah clearly told us, Inna Allah la yughayru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayru ma bi anfusihim. Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. No change. We start making a move on ourselves. Forgive each other. Forgive the brother. Forgive the sister. Unify with other masajid. Pray with other people who are making a salat in, in another imam. Enjoy the benefits of all of the scholars of Islam. Learn to love each other and to love the broadness of the Sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ had this type of wisdom. This is what we need today. We will get an argument over a point. In the other day when we were uh, in the, the, the University of Melbourne and um, the, the, the brothers were upstairs and then they made salat, some of them followed the Jama'at and some of them made their own prayers. And they started fighting each other. They said, I'm right. One said, no, I mean, you can't follow them. You can't see them. 
The other one said, well, no, you can't see them in Mecca either. You're on the third floor, you know, whatever. What's your problem, man? So one made it, and the other made it, and they both... You know what it reminded me of? It reminded me of the time of Ben al-Qurayda. That the Prophet Sallallahu after the Battle of the Trench, the angels came to him and said, you know, the angels have not taken off their armor yet. Go to Ben al-Qurayda. This is the place of the Yahud, who had made treachery against the Muslims and opened up uh, that part of Medina. And so the Prophet Sallallahu said, do not pray except in Banu Qurayza. La yusallianna ahadukum al-asa illa fi Bani Qurayza. O kama kali sattu salam. None of you should make asa salat until you reach Banu Qurayza. Some of the Sahaba said no. The Prophet said this, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said we should pray asa on time. So I'm making salat. Because Allah is above the Prophet. That's his decision. The other people, the other people said, no, Rasulullah said this. So we're going to hold Asa and reach Benu Qurayza. And they start fighting each other. I am right, like my fatwa is right. They didn't say my school of thought. They didn't have imams then, right? But then they said, no, my opinion is this. He said, no, my opinion is that. And so when they reached the Prophet Sallallahu and they said, which one is right? You know what his answer was? Both of you are correct. You are both correct. You made your uh, uh, decision based on submission to Allah. You made your decision following the, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. You are both correct. And we say to our brothers in consultation with the, with the imams and leadership here, whether you're upstairs in the University of Melbourne or pray by yourself, you're both correct. We don't have to fight each other over small things like this. This is how the shaitan, the evil one, comes to us and brings this unity in the ranks of the believers. So I leave you with these thoughts, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on me and you, and I pray that Allah would bless this masjid and bring back the glory of the great Uthmaniyya of the Ottoman Empire. May Allah bring it back to the Muslim Ummah and unite the ranks of the believers everywhere we are in this planet. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, so we open up the floor for questions. Fadl, brother. Yes. Okay, there is a study which is being not done right now, and I reviewed the tape and I, I gave a copy to the brothers of Isna. Inshallah, they'll make it available to you. This was a program on uh, a television series called Fatawa Ar Rahma, uh, Sheikh Mohammed Hassan. A uh, very well-known sheikh uh, uh, from Egypt, and he introduced a scholar whose name is uh, his name was Said Ibrahim as Sherbini, and uh, he's an Egyptian also, and he uh, took up a subject, which is um, the universal science of linguistics, and this study began in the year 2003. It is a new science which has developed in linguistics. And in the University of London, he took his uh, masters in this subject. And now he's bringing his dissertation. When he, when he started the subject, what this subject does, it studies all the languages that people speak. And based upon the sounds in the language, and based upon the history of language, they can determine whether a language will stay or whether it will be stagnated and die. And they have found out that languages live like people. A person starts as a child and then goes into adulthood and then uh, old age and then weakness and die. Similarly, languages go through the same thing. And they have estimated there have been about a thousand known languages in the world. Of these thousand known languages, 400 languages are dead. There's about 601 languages remaining. And because of <clears throat> globalization now, and industrialization and conquering, there's about 50 languages per year are dying. Because everybody wants to speak English, or they want to speak the language of the conqueror. And so languages are dying now in a rapid rate. And so they're doing this universal study. When our, our, our brother Said, uh, Ibrahim al-Sharbini, when he's entered into the course 
Arabic language was not even considered. So he put Arabic language in there and he used science. This is not religion. These people are not religious. They are going by linguistics, the history of language, the sounds in the language. They can tell whether a language is dying. They are now saying the most recent language which is dead is Nubian language. You know Bilad and Nuba? In Aswan, right? In Aswan. When you go south, they're saying the Nubian language is now considered to be dead. And this is how languages go down. And so Arabic was not even considered. He did a paper, a master's paper, and when he put Arabic language to all the scientific thing, now Arabic is number two. The most powerful language now that they say will last more than anything is Mandarin Chinese. Because Chinese, by, by the very numbers of China itself, and also the history of China, they say that has longevity. It will last. But now, Saeed is saying he has a paper right now. He has shown it to the people. They have agreed upon it. And when it comes out, Arabic will be language number one. What is he proving in this? He is proving that Arabic is the original language spoken by Adam alayhi salam. It is Logatul Um. And in London itself, they have changed the Arabic Qismul Logatul Arabiya. Now it is Qismul Logatul Um. It is, the, it is the department of the mother language, the original language. And they are so serious about this. They are watching languages die. They even are taking some uh, great English books and they're translating them into Arabic. Because if all the other languages die, they're saying right now, because of the makeup of Arabic languages, they're saying it will outlast all the other languages. These are not religious people. And the thing that shocked the scientists is that when they look at languages, the, uh, each uh, word has got syllables. And so if you say uh, industrial, you have in, dus, tri, l. So there's different sil syllables going inside of it. And so they put the word Allah. They put Allah into the machine. It's a machine that judges sound. And you would say, ah, ah, you know, it sounds like it has, when you put it in, it's only one sound. It's only one sound. And you look at it, it seems like it has syllables, but it comes out one sound. They said they have never found any word in any language which has syllables and only comes out one sound. It's the only word in the human race, which again show Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, Shirbini is proving now that this will be the language of Jannah. It'll be the language of the day of, of judgment. And this is, is something which is so important to us. And that's why we, we, we should, uh, uh, we should uh, uh, encourage our children to learn Arabic. I'm just coming from the Gulf region now, and if you speak English, the best job you can get in the, in the Gulf and Muslim country is teaching English. Because everybody wants to learn English. But who wants to learn Arabic? And this is something that Shaitan is, is doing to us. These are non-Muslims. And some of these people have accepted Islam based on the work of Sharbini. They say, I'm Muslim. This is the language. Because I can see your language is going to outlast every language. And he tells them the basis of this language, the longevity, is the Quran. You want to understand Arabic? Go to the Quran. That's the basis. And so we need to learn classical Arabic. And those of you who, who speak Arabic also teach the children Fusha. Teach them Fusha. When you say, What is your name? Masmuka. They say, Ismuk, eh, Shinnu Ismuk, Ish Ismuk. Teach them how to speak Arabic, man. Maharash Haga. Teach them how to speak Arabic. Yes, we need Amiya because we talk to each other and it's sweet, right? But the real language which will outlast is Fusha. This is the language of Adam alayhi salam.
This is the language, inshallah, the language of Jannah, the final language. And so this tape, inshallah, which is presented through uh, Sheikh Muhammad Hassan, um, I have left um, the, the file of this. It's in Arabic language. Inshallah, uh, brothers can translate it. I will I leave the fi file with uh, Abu Hamza and the people of Isna. They will have the file. And inshallah, you can get this uh, 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 little disc or this file, and you can watch the program on Fatawa or Rahma. And we're waiting for more studies from uh, uh, Saeed Ibrahim al Sherbini. Jazawallah khair. Question. I'll just ask two questions. One definition uh, about fatwa. The other question is, I'm from Somalia, and we have at this topic you talk about five different religious groups. Right. They're all Muslim, but a lot of them they grew in different ways, and they all claim they different, different Muslims. Mm. So what do you comment on that? Okay, well, I mean, I am not a mufti myself. I am a dawah, a dawah person. I'm a da'iyah, right? And, um, but, you know, the, the fatwa is giving you a religious decision, and they have to take into consideration, you know, the environment and the circumstances. You know, they, they use the Quran and the sunnah and the ijma, and they will bring you, you know, a proper decision based upon all the circumstances. So the mufti should not give you a decision immediately. They will sit down and look at it and give you a proper decision. In terms of Somalia itself, and we make dua that Allah will bless that land and will bring peace to the land. I became very close to the Somali nation myself. I was the Imam of the Jami Mosque in Toronto, which has one of the largest communities in the world now, Somali communities. In 1985, there was two Somalis in the mosque. And then after two years, 60% of the Musallis were from Somalia, Eritrea, and Hara, and places like this. Okay? And they said, Brother uh, Abdullah, you know, we're Somalis. Everybody had similar names, Abdi, uh, Rahman, or they were Shafi, you know, whatever, similar. And then one day, um, they had, uh, there was a struggle in Western Somalia called Ogaden. And so we made dua for the people who were struggling in the Ogaden. And then come, somebody came to me and said, Brother Abdullah, you're innocent. Your muadzin is Darod. In the mosque down the street is Hawiya. On the northern side is Ishaq. Right? And I'm saying, what is this, man? Then they said, now you don't know, Midigan, the Midiganis. Right? Somalis know what I'm talking about. Right? Jarir. And his different groups. And so this tribalism, the Prophet ﷺ said, leave tribalism and nationalism. It is filthy. Tribalism is killing us. And I know that people have died. And it's not easy to forgive somebody who killed someone in your family. But the Prophet ﷺ and his companions, when they opened up Mecca, they had to embrace people who tortured them to death, who killed their families, who drove them out of their homes. They had to embrace them as their brothers and sisters. They had to forgive them. Man. So we as Muslims, we need to forgive each other. We have to forgive each other. How to come out of the problem? Allah knows best. I can only say on the outside, you know, uh, we have to return to the essence of Islam and we make dua for the people in that region there. In terms of, we want to talk about the, the subject here for your everyday fiqh questions, uh, you need to go to local faqih, right, for everyday fiqh. Okay? And we, we, you know, we, but, but general questions um, uh, we want to try to deal with. What do you do if you're forced to commit haram and become an unmodest person because your life depends upon it? The Prophet ﷺ said that anything that we do by khata uh, and nisyan, if you make a mistake or you forget or you're compelled, you're forced to do something, the pen is lifted. The pen is not writing. So if somebody's forced to do something which is haram, and the pen is not writing. If you do something by mistake, you're forgiven. If you do something forgetfully, you're forgiven. We were talking earlier today about Amma ibn Yasir radiallahu an. Amma came to the Prophet sallallahu and he said, I have destroyed myself. And the Prophet said, how? He said, I said kalimatul kufa. He was tortured. And he said the word of disbelief. The Prophet sallallahu said, how was your heart? He said, my heart was strong in faith. So the Prophet said, then you are on the path, or in words. You're okay. 
So anything done by force, uh, the pen is not writing at that time. How do you protect your heart from corruption that we are surrounded by and attain a sound heart? This is the thing we need to know, like these madakhil, these are the entrances of the shaitan into the hearts. So just like soldiers that are guarding the fort, you need to guard yourself against all some of these areas. And some of it is just sometimes it's just eating too much, eating spicy food and all these things, getting satisfied, being jealous of other people, right? Being suspect of other people, right? Glorifying individuals. Some of these things, these are the things we need to protect our hearts from. And these are practical issues that we will face in our lives and we need to take it as a practical thing. <coughs> it says, what advice can you give to Muslim brothers who find it hard to stay out of trouble and always end up with the wrong crowd? The Prophet ﷺ said very clearly, Ar-Rajlu ala dini khalili. Falyandu ahadukum men yukhalilu. The Prophet ﷺ said, a, a man, a person will be on the religion of his friend. So take care who you make your friends. So if you find somebody who, who, who makes a lot and fasts is a good person, that, make that person your friend. If you know the person doesn't make a lot, he's swearing, he's fighting, right, he's carrying on, then just stay away, man. Because that person will lead you into the wrong crowd and lead you into a dangerous situation. So we need to watch our friends. How much time we have left before our uh, salat? Five. Yes, brother. Yeah. Before Christopher Columbus uh, um, uh, in the Americas, how was um, Islam before before that? And yeah. um, the status of the of the state of um, the Native Americans, um, mm -hmm. how how are they um, uh, going towards Islam? Okay. We have the doc the question is what is the condition of uh, Muslims in America, especially before Columbus? Um, I will be leaving with um, Isna as well in their library. Uh, they will be producing a book called Deeper Roots. And this shows the history of Muslims in America before Columbus to the present. And so we have documented evidence that Muslims reached America. When you read the writing of Al-Mas'udi, the famous uh, scholar in Muruj al-Dahab, Al-Idrisi, Al-Umari, Ibn Qutiya, and these famous Islamic geographers and historians, they talked about people went across the ocean. They went across the ocean. Also, a great king from Mali, an Islamic empire, his name was Mansa Musa. He made pilgrimage to Mecca in 1324, and he had 72,000 people on Hajj in 1324. It's the king of Mali. And when he reached Egypt at the time of the Mamluks, the Mamluk fell in love with him. And they. Um, uh, he was given uh, questions and they said, how did you get this power? He said, my elder uh, brother Abu Bakr, he was before me, I inherited this power. My brother went into the Atlantic Ocean with 2,000 ships and he never returned. And now we have proof. If you take the currents that go from Senegal, Gambia, Senegambia, it takes you right across, you don't need sails, it takes you right into Brazil, or you take another one, it goes into Barbados in the West Indies. So we have documented evidence showing the presence of the Mandinka people from West Africa crossing the uh, Amazon into Panama, into Mexico, and into the United States all the way up to Canada. And they were, um, they mixed with the native people of America. There's proof amongst the natives um, there's pictures of natives in the Seminoles in Florida with turbans on, with Arabic names. The Cherokee nation, Cherokees, they used to pray toward the east, and according to the elders, they used to say, Ya Allah, and face east. There's documentation of the presence of Muslims in America long before Columbus. Christopher Columbus, actually, he was lost, man. He thought he was in India, and he bumped into America on the way. And he said, you are Indians. But they're not Indians, man. It's not India. He was lost. But they said he discovered America. So Muslims were there before. And in the culture of America, there's different waves, a number of waves that came in. 
Muslim played a strong part in the history of that country, and that is the reason why it's the fastest growing religion in America. That's the reason why, up until now, it's the roots of the people. And so we have documented evidence, which inshallah will be made available uh, to you right here uh, in uh, Melbourne. The question said, if a family member is doing adultery and you have advised them on many occasions, but they don't want to know halal and haram, can you stop communication with them? Um, definitely, uh, if a person is doing haram, then you need to take a strong stand. And that person needs to be advised based on the situation. And a strong stance needs to be taken against that person. Because the Quran is saying, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ zina إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاهِشَةً وَسَاءَ sabila." Do not come close to zina. It is an abomination, an evil thing. It will destroy everything in its path. It will destroy the, the boy, the girl, the family's reputation, the children that are coming. It destroys everything. Now it spreads HIV AIDS, venereal disease, all types of things happening with this. So we have to take a strong stance. There are many things happening within our families. And so we encourage the, the Masajid and the Islamic centers. We need to have counseling, specialized counseling for Muslims. And that counselor needs to be a trained person. If you have social workers, get the social workers into the masjid. That's what we did. We had the social worker work with the imams. If the person tells you their secret, don't go around the corner and tell the brothers. You have to swear to confidentiality. You cannot tell the secrets of other people. That's our problem. We talk. We would like to talk and tell things. You cannot tell the secret. That person, if a sister comes to you and she is abused, it's a serious situation. And you have to take her serious. You can't say sabah, sister, sabah. You got to deal with the abuser. He's got to be dealt with. And if you can't do it, bring in the authorities. If you don't have the strength to do it. Because in our society, if we had an Islamic state, we would deal with the abuser. We would not allow anybody to be abused. And so it is crucial for us now, we need to provide counseling uh, for each other. That's not the Adhan, right? Somebody's phone? <laughs> it says, uh, uh, it is said that we should follow only one Imam, otherwise we would be confused. Is it right? Uh, if yes, then to whom? Um, you know, in terms of um, Imam, the word Imam is translated in different ways. Basically the Imam, there is an Imam in a masjid that you will follow to lead, uh, who leads you in Salat. There is also an Imam or Amir who is the leader of the community. That person really you could say the, the Amir. But sometimes we take words out of context. Okay, so it is important for the communities to have somebody solid who leads Salat, who gives the, you know, the, the, the fatwas that are needed, who gives religious education, whatever, that's important. But it's also important for the community to have a Majlis Ashura and to have an Amir. Have somebody who can represent the Muslims in their area. Or if you cannot get one, have a committee of people that have representatives of different uh, groupings. And then they can represent the Muslims, especially if their problems are with the local government or various serious issues that affect all of the Muslims. Each area is different, and I do not, I'm not going to judge you, I don't know what has happened in the past, but this is the, the, the suggestion that we have, uh, that we have tried to do in Cape Town, in South Africa, to have a Majlis Ashura uh, to represent different bodies of Muslims. Question. Yeah, just uh, regarding that question, I'm pretty sure that mm -hmm. uh, it's referring to the four schools of thought, and if we should follow one, there's a, there's a common, there's a common uh, way of thinking that you have to follow one method and yeah. if you take teachings from all methods you get confused I'm pretty sure that's what that would be okay well no this is dealing with something a little this one seems the imam this is based on the on the, on the thing that happened today now any other general uh, questions that we have before we close down yeah
Like drinking alcohol. Okay, itta itself, if you put on perfume, there's nothing wrong with that. It's the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. He loved itta, right? So there's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, in the case of a woman, however, it is said that the itta of the man is something which is, has a smell that comes out. But the itta of the woman is something that may have left a stain, but the smell doesn't protrude. Right? You'd only smell it if you're right on the person. And the Prophet ﷺ described women who had this perfume on that's out there as like people who are committing adultery. And you will see it, it when they wear this perfume now. Like I said, I'm just coming out of the Gulf region and stuff and whatever. They have all these perfume shops, right? And they're wearing this perfume. You walk along and the perfume hits you. And it like floors you on the ground because of the smell. Right? So th these, these things are, are dangerous. Anything which is going to lead us to fornication and adultery, we should avoid. We should avoid all of these things. Now, yes, brother. Yeah, there is some discussion um, about, I, I was living in Bahrain, but there is some discussion that in Qatar, that they are planning to do a movie about the Prophet ﷺ. And, um, but now they're just researching it and whatnot, but they appear to be, um, the people who are doing it appear to be uh, very religious people. So hopefully they will research it and do it properly. You know, and, and not, um, it is something that is, it is, it is needed in a sense, but again, it, it's a dangerous area to get into uh, because you can misrepresent uh, individuals, you know, and whatnot. So, but it appears that they seem to be uh, fairly well grounded and they're taking their time. And hopefully they will not make any major mistakes. Now. Brother, there was talk about the, trying to rewrite the Quran. Yeah. The um, there was, the, there, there is some book that they put out where they um, tried to write their own Quran. The Christians are trying to do this. And they put out some copies of this in Jordan. Some of them appeared, I think, in Kuwait. And they appeared so that you know, they tried to write their own uh, thing like this. But of course, they will never be able to do it uh, in the Arabic language, of course. Nobody has ever been able to. And up until now, they have never done it. And what things that they tried was laughable in terms of the language and whatnot. You know, it, they, they have given up now in trying to do that. Now what they're trying to do is to give a bad image of Islam and to say that the Quran leads to terrorism and they say Islamofascism, that it's fascism. This is the latest attack which is coming now, a movie called um, Obsession, which was uh, passed around in the United States. So, so th this, is the, this is the latest uh, things you know, that has come. Okay, one more final uh, point. Yes, uh, regarding the Hassan, you said it eats your Hassanat and the fire <coughs> Okay, this is an important point about jealousy. This is the final uh, uh, question. And this is the point about je everybody can feel hasad, something inside of yourself. But you need, the scholars say you need to remember, um, you know, your opposition with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that material things come and they go. And when we think about this, you know, then it, it can take hasad of our heart. Because sometimes if a person has a lot of money, it's actually a curse. It's not a blessing. And we see it has happened to many uh, societies in front of us. So you know, may Allah protect us against this and clean our hearts and unite our ranks. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Akhara da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.